Uh, like I said, my name is Milos Nadovic. I represent EuroLeague Basketball. And we're very happy here today to uh, share with you some stories from our league and from our clubs, especially clubs that we consider to be uh, some of our showcase clubs and some of the leaders on the commercial side. Une has been the chief business officer of Zalgiris Kaunas for the last, I think, four years. And the team has experienced really drastic growth in that time period in terms of uh, ticket sales and premium seating sales. And Fabian is a, a fairly recent signing for FC Bayern Basketball, but he has a background in the sports industry and in Adidas more, more recently, and is an excellent purchase for, for the Bayern team and is there to, to continue the excellent work that his colleagues so far have done. So without further ado, we can start the, the panel. I see Una is having some technical problems, so maybe we can start with Fabian. But before that, let me just let you guys know, this is a 45-minute session. We'll go around asking questions to both Fabian and Dune with regards to their club's pers perspectives on premium ticket sales and hospitality and to see their opinions, their strategies, and their outlooks in the future. We'll have a couple of questions for, for each one of the panelists, and maybe we can open it up to the field um, after that is done, in case there is time. So until Una comes back, I will start off with the first question for, for Fabian. And uh, Fabian, uh, well, your club has, has grown immensely in the last four or five years, and I think they've you have more than doubled in terms of revenue from ticket sales and premium seating. And I'm always very, very pleasantly surprised at the atmosphere that, that happens at your games whenever I go to, to Munich. So really, I want to ask you how, do you, how do you prospect new clients for hospitality products? And, and how do you attract new clients, especially B2B, because you guys have a very big focus on B2B? Yeah, uh, first of all, hello everybody. Thanks for for giving the platform to us here to to present some of the the nice work. Specifically, you know, like Milo said, uh, done and initiated by by most of the colleagues of mine. Um, you're absolutely right. I think the the atmosphere that we have here in in Bayern Munich, uh, home games for basketball, is really unique. Uh, we have basically two initiatives um, to drive mainly business customer to our games. Uh, besides, you know, in, in basketball, you sit uh, nice, warm and dry even during the winter. Uh, but these two initiatives are, uh, first of all, is a business circle. Uh, we have initiated one, one of the most exclusive business circle communities uh, in the German professional um, sports landscape. This is an exclusive networking club for B2B customers. You get access only by purchasing a certain amount of VIP tickets. Um, and then during the year, um, we are uh, hosting them here in an exclusive area uh, in, in our home game venue in the Audi Dome. And B, we are organizing in between five to six uh, different panel uh, events where we discuss certain uh, topics, you know, certain certain more actual or or you know um, usual usual topics out of the business world. Uh, we invite uh, very high quality panel um, discussion members uh, from the club or from external, from our um, partner network, etc. Um, and that's that's being perceived as very successful. Right now, we're looking at a at a company portfolio of over 350 uh, different companies uh, that are joining this business circle. Uh, the other one is that we have a sales department uh, for, for ticketing that is focused on, on B2B customers, which uh, so far is working very well because uh, most of the clubs in Germany outsourcing um, the, the sales to, to certain agency or online. Uh, and we make the experience that our own sales department can speak um, to customers in a, in a different language, uh, more personal, uh, more from the inside of the club. You know, whenever I talk to your colleagues from the sales side, I'm always amazed by, by what I see in terms of results where 
companies buy tickets or buy expensive VIP hospitality packages just so they can form part of the business circle. And, and then that's the business circle becomes the hook for them to join the club. And then afterwards they do, they can gather all the different advantages of going to basketball and the great experience that you offer. And I think you guys are, are one of the first ones on the continent, at least to have done this type of, this type of package. Uh, do you also, I think that was done before COVID. Do you also uh, offer your business customers to travel to uh, away games with the clubs or uh, to, to travel to, let's say, when, uh, when the club goes to a different country, you take some clients with you and then you organize events and meetings with sponsors and partners of different clubs? Uh, not on a regular basis. We're organizing what we so-called VIP events where, you know, we go even beyond the business circle to, to invite, uh, you know, VIP, VIP ticket holders to, to make these kind of um, trips. Uh, so far, the link to other to other club members is missing, but I would love to do that. I mean, this is a great opportunity. Uh, specifically, you know, if you if you look into our partner portfolio and also the business circle portfolio, you mostly talk to to international business partners. Yeah, so uh, the internationalization is very important, and um, it's it's a it's a KPI. Uh, that we as uh, one of the new permanent uh, license holder of the EuroLeague uh, can offer. I think it's fantastic. And uh, jumping to UNE, whose club has also done fantastically over the last years, um, actually since 2016, we've, we've gone over the, the maths, the ticket sales and premium seating revenue in Zalgiris has grown by over 200% which coincidentally uh, is the same amount of time that UNE has been in charge at the club. So uh, UNE, please let us know, how, how did you go about developing this, this sales strategy from, from such humble beginnings to, to a juggernaut that it is now? And, and how, how does that process really come about? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, around actually five years ago, uh, what we did, we changed the strategy of what actually we are selling. So before that, we were selling mostly tickets and victories, you know, having a winning team, and that was the main product. Uh, but what we started doing is that we figured that actually, if we are only selling basketball and we have people in the seats who are here for the basketball, it's not very different from what they can they could get from television or from broadcast. So we changed into selling not basketball itself, not tickets itself, uh, but selling emotions, selling the experience in the arena, uh, selling being part of the community. So these became our key selling points and drivers. And uh, we started changing the mindset within organization. Uh, and also we changed the, the, the message that we put out there. And, and yeah, and, and then we got people coming here for the you know, right expectations. And we start you know, offering what actually we can keep the promise. I think this is one of, one of the main rules you know, for sustainable business growth to, to create the expectations that we can later meet and we, as a as a management team, you know, we can we can't control uh, winning games, and we can't, you know, we, we don't even pick players ourselves, and we are not in the practices. So there is no way for us to actually promise uh, our clients to come here, support the team, and then we will win. You know, there is no way we can deliver that. So we wanted to sell something that we can deliver, and that is experience, because we can. You know, we can design the experience and all the touch points of the visitor journey. And this is what we start doing. And once we got people who come here for the experience and who come here to have a nice time and fun night out, then we saw the rise of uh, uh, demand for hospitality. And uh, we, we just had, you know, people in the arena who are here to basically enjoy themselves. So that allowed us to increase our revenue as, as you mentioned, by 200%, even from ticketing, but also from, from hospitality and other services as well. And it created us an opportunity to cross-sell and nap-sell once we have those clients. And also why I said, I think this is a sustainable business growth uh, strategy. It's very important for us that the people who come to the arena, they 
they'll even come back. They, they should come back, but they also we want them to bring their families, colleagues, and, you know, and friends. So we want not to only meet their expectations because when you meet the expectations, they do come back. And when you manage to exceed their expectations, uh, then they become your ambassador. And this is what we were, you know, reaching so, yeah, and I think that went pretty well. I think it's a fantastic approach. What basically, just to, to sum it up, really, it's you're controlling every aspect of the journey that you can't control, that you can't control, which the only thing that you cannot is just what happens on the court. Everything else you guys have under lock and key, and you know exactly what the customer can expect and what they should receive. And I think a big part of that is also that you play in one of the, the best venues on the continent in the Zilgiri arena. And what, what role does the venue play in your hospitality sales strategy? And have you been able to, to reshape the, the venue and your seating bowl to fit a more premium audience or a more diverse audience? Absolutely. It is great that we can uh, oper- we are operating the venue ourselves because what I mentioned before, by being the operator as well, we can control all the touch points and we can design and we can design different experience for different segments and different types of customers. We can offer different experience for first time comer. You know, that is very different when you're coming for the first time, it's a big building and you know, it's, and, and you need to navigate yourself and so on. So we can offer different experience to them and experience to loyal clients, premium clients, uh, business clients, uh, music clients and, you know, and sports clients. So that, that is great, great advantage that we can, you know, we are operating the venue ourselves. And, and yeah, and once we saw, again, the, the people coming to have fun, uh, we saw demand for hospitality. And of course, we reacted to that demand. So we created additional premium club. So basically, we took very average seating zone that basically didn't have much potential to make much more money out of it. Uh, but we did, we added additional values to it. So you know, uh, separate entrance and free cloak room and a nice lounge, uh, lounge zone and a uh, different menu. Uh, we, you know, sold uh, the, the branding uh, to a partner and our investment paid off in, in three months. And now we are making the twice of, you know, of the revenue from, from that zone. Uh, we also uh, increased the, the number of courtside seats uh, we started building um, more premium seats above the regular zones, just uh, bar tables, lift chairs, and so on. And people do pay premium for that because that is it's also, you know, some different experience. Um, so yeah, we offered, we reacted, and we offered different different values. We also started actually, we did copy uh, Bayern Munich, and we offered a business club as well, and we only offered. Uh, to the to the clients, hospitality clients, and uh, we wanted to offer them, uh, you know, additional value to meet each other and to do business with each other. That's excellent. One of my my favorite things to see or to have seen in your arena is that you basically cut down some seats to make sure that the bar and the, a bar area can be can be placed in the regular seating zone. So you technically have a few less seats, but the yield you get in those new ones is just that much higher, right? Absolutely. And we were really thinking about what to do with the actual regular seats, especially on the upper bowl, because we start to notice that people sometimes they rather watch the game on television if we don't have any seats on the on the first floor. But, you know, we not we were thinking and we saw the, the examples in other arenas you now when they when they take down the seats and they bring a pool there or sauna or something like that. So I thought, OK, that's going to be our plan B. Uh, but, you know, for, for starters, let's try something else. So we also s- start working a lot of with activations in the corridors and just, uh, um, and yeah, just different values for, for customers who are on the upper bowl, all kind of games. And that was a good, good way for us to actually uh, find a partnership with our sponsors and partners who wanted to become a part of the partner of activations. And we start, you know, we developed a map of what you can do on the upper level, and we, and actually, that worked really well for us to, to give reasons for people to come to Arena early. That was a big goal for us as well because we saw people coming to Arena 15 minutes before the game, and there is no way we can, you know, get them all in very quickly and, you know, you know, within seconds. It's still, it's, it's naturally they they form queues. So giving this extra reasons to come to Arena early, uh, that worked 
really well for us, you know, to, to, to put concession stands into work and to basically offer better experience. Yes, and, and the venue issue in is, is key, I think. And we've seen this in, in our league where the clubs who like Zalgiris have, or like Bayern, have the ability to work with their venue in terms of really commercializing it more eh? and grabbing as many opportunities as you can from it. Those are the clubs that benefit. There's others that simply just act as tenants in their venues and their options for monetization are severely limited by that fact. So us as the league, we always also try to work with our clubs to gain more operational control over their new venues, and especially if they're going to move to a new venue. And the case of FC Bayern Basketball is one of those cases who will be moving to the, the brand new SAP Garden in, in I believe, uh, two years. Fabian, correct me if yeah, I'm wrong. 23 23, that's right. And uh, how, how will you plan to use the new hospitality spaces available for, for your strategy? And just as a side note, have you been working with the arena in terms of design of hospitality spaces? Yeah, so, so the challenge that we are with the new SAP garden is that we're basically doubling our, our VIP, our, our premium hospitality area. So this is, this is, a, this is a opportunity, but also a challenge for us. Um, so, you know, as, as the name says, with SAP Garden, we are looking at uh, a place that will offer us a huge digital playground. Uh, so uh, what we're trying to increase is definitely the overall experience, but we will have a very strong focus uh, on the digital displays and interaction that we're going to have, even with our, our VIP guests. Uh, so that, that will be for sure focus. Um, the, the reason why we're doing that is also practically we, we're sharing um, this garden uh, with a local uh, professional ice hockey club. So, you know, uh, it's not like a permanent branding and permanent uh, uh, ownership that we have here in our current dome. So we need to look at into um, very innovative and creative ways to, to interact with, with our VIP guests and obviously on different levels. Um, you know, we have partners that we need to interact with in, in the public space. Um, but for, for um, our, our business guests, with our VIP guests, we are really trying to connect with them on an exclusive area. We're trying, besides the digitalization, we're trying to create space uh, for them in order to meet, to connect, to network, and basically bring the people together. Uh, it goes hand in hand what Una said. It's like we want to increase the overall um, consumer journey, no matter uh, how high the ticket price is. Uh, we want to bring the relevant, the relevant experience to them uh, while they are coming, and spe specifically in focus on to make them come again. You know, uh, obviously, moving into a new arena, we have a little bit the the advantage of an event character. People will just come to look at the arena. This is our opportunity to to catch them, to 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 bait them out, and and to to see, you know, how can we. Uh, increase their experience so much that they want to come again. So that's probably something, um, no, that's not probably, that's the, the main focus that we have and that we want to establish. Uh, another thing that we're going to do around the, the hospitality area is that we're going to use or that we're going to create and use uh, more uh, variety in the spaces around uh, the hospitality. So we will have, you know, like uh, regular VIP places like everybody knows him and you know you just grab you go back into an hospitality area and have some food but we will also have terraces boxes uh, exclusive tables where you know you can basically watch the game uh, from from a non-seat kind of perspective uh, we have a lot more courtside seats available and we can bring the game much much closer um, to, to everybody there so so that's basically the the key goals that we want to follow um, in terms of your second question, um, you know, are we included into the interior design? Yes, we are. Um, unfortunately, the, the whole uh, pro or the progress of the building is not that far as we hope. So we're starting with this. Uh, but we have our own expectations and uh, it would be a lie if we're not looking right and left, uh, like experiences with Zagiris or uh, even across the pond into the U.S., um, how they how they building up the experiences, um, specifically in, in larger gyms that have a capacity of 10,000 and plus. Um, so the whole atmosphere needs to be saved. And this is something where we where we specifically going to have an eye on the interior. 
Um, but again, I'm coming back to the initial point. We want to create space. We want to create a, an atmosphere where people can just connect and come together. Uh, again, no matter how much they pay for, for the ticket. And for VIP, this is really around networking and uh, giving them the opportunity to, to come together and, and discuss, discuss further opportunities. That's excellent. I want to highlight two things that uh, Fabian has said in, in his last answer. The first one, which I think is absolutely key, is the variety of different options that Bayern plan to provide for their hospitality customers in the new arena, right? He said not only seats, but boxes, terraces, bars, restaurants. We found that in, in most arenas where there's a, 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 let's say, a variety of, of different products on offer, it's much more easier to sell, especially to a high paying customer, because you can create an offer that's specifically made for them. And our salespeople, and I think Fabian's as well, when they go into a prospective meeting with a client or with a, with a company, they can provide uh, several different options to have a really tailor-made offer for them in terms, of, in terms of what kind of hospitality option they can offer. And the second thing I wanted to um, jump back to is, Fabian, can you just let the, the room know so they're aware uh, what the current hospitality capacity is in the Audi Dome and what you will be jumping to in the SAP Garden? Yeah, we jump from from roughly. Well, we have it's a difficult answer. Uh, we we have two forms of VIP tickets that we offer. We offer like true VIP tickets, but we offer also something around like after the game, which we call VIP light. Altogether, there is something uh, around six hundred, and we're moving up to one thousand two hundred in the new SAP guard. So double, completely double. Yeah. Wow. Can you just shed, a, shed some light on this concept of the VIP light after the, after the game? Well, we figured out that, you know, like most of the people, you know, they come before the, the VIP guests, they come before the, the game, um, they have a decent meal. We, have, we really have an excellent restaurant partner. Um, and and they, stay, they stay over halftime. And then most of the, the VIP guests, they leave immediately after the game or even during the game. Um, so then we figured out that after the game, um, there's a lot of room in the VIP area. And what we do is we also bring the players into the v VIP area that makes uh, a very good connection, a very close contact uh, in between partners and, and real VIP guests to, to the players. Uh, it's not like we're having 60 minutes of photo request uh, and answer dates, but you know you can see them. Uh, you, you can maybe quickly talk to them while they grab some food or stuff, but, but that's basically it. So we bring the team and the spectators closer together and we figured out that this is a chance for, for like regular ticket holder to come into the VIP area even after the game uh, for, for an extra price, for an extra ticket that they buy and they can just, you know, like enjoy a regular food, good food and, and also come close to the team. That's excellent. That's a great idea. Jumping topics a little bit, going back to Une, um, can you let us know what the future holds for Zalgiris Kaunas and maybe some new projects that you've been planning or maybe some new trends you have spotted? Yeah, sure. Well, um, as surprising as it is, uh, worldwide pandemic was not in our strategy. So we had to change some things and resign and even to pause some of the projects that we were doing and where we were going. But also it presented opportunity for us as we see it. And uh, we start working a lot with experience outside the venue, meaning digital experience. And, uh, and yeah, so we started a couple of different projects uh, for the, the, the sports side, for the basketball fans. We started this digital community and platform for them to, you know, to get in touch and uh, a platform for us to monetize our fans better uh, because we figured that, you know, there is no lockdown on internet. So when our normal revenue streams were shut down, we started working on, on this project and uh, we offer, um, basically we offer uh, content that they can subscribe, they can choose different plans. So there is like a, a bit, simple plan and then more premium plan. Uh, and then they can also chat and comment and they can ask a lot of questions and they can vote for things and so on and so on. 
So we started doing this uh, with the goal for us to basically monetize people even after the pandemic uh, to monetize our fans who are not maybe not in the same city, maybe they're living abroad. And uh, also before pandemic, we were selling out, you know, we had waiting lists for hospitality and we knew that there are more potential and there are more fans that would like to be bigger part of the club, but there is nothing we can offer to them once we sell out. So we think that this project will be beneficial uh, even after we come back to the normal, you know, normal life as it was to be, as it used to be. And, uh, and yeah, so for the people who are coming to the arena, that's additional experience, you know, before they come and after they come, they can see, you know, videos from locker room, they can, you know, hear microphones on players and these kind of things. And for people who are, who can't be, who couldn't get a ticket, or maybe they just live somewhere else, they, they can, you know, be part of it as well. So that is one project. And uh, from the arena side, um, we're also working on uh, mobile ordering and uh, digital personalization platform that we will offer. Uh, we're working with Real Life Tech uh, on, on this. And we started even before pandemic. And before pandemic, that was like a nice thing to have. And now I definitely think this is a must have thing because a lot of people who were not that tech savvy, uh, they were quite forced during the pandemic and during the lockdowns to become more tech savvy and they, they, you know, they all went online. And, uh, and yeah, so we think that this technology is basically vital for us to offer good experience and safe experience. And also it is, uh, it really helps us because now we struggle uh, after we came back, we struggle to actually find enough people for concession stands because we see that a lot of people we had before they requalified, you know, they went somewhere else, delivery, maybe IT, and, and they don't want to come back anymore. So actually we have big problems with finding people uh, to, work, uh, you know, to work in the concession stands, basically. So we think that this technology will become our key seller. And, um, and, and yeah, and actually very powerful seller when you think about it, because it's someone who can, you know, uh, personalize offers, someone who effectively can cross sell and upsell. So I think, I think that that will be a big part of our, you know, coming back strategy. The, the issue of workforce for, for large venues is something that we're seeing all across the continent and not just in, in terms of the sports entertainment, but in terms of hospitality in general, as in hotels, restaurants, and everything, the, the, the lack of, of real service staff. And this is something that, that we as, as people in the sports business have to really take, take into account. And I think Una's approach of digital is, is key in this, in this regard. And the club is already in last season has done many digital initiatives to, to make fans feel closer to the game. Una, can you, can you let us know the results of some of those? Uh, yeah. So first of all, when we had this idea that we want to create some virtual experience uh, service before we went, you know, hard on coding the, the, that platform. We wanted to do some tests, so we actually introduced virtual experience ticket, so people can people who buy the ticket. Uh, we also did the open price because it was a hard time for the club, so you can just yeah. choose the amount you want to pay for the ticket, and um, we invited them to just basically log in, and we had the same announcer that we have. Uh, normally during the games announcing the team and you know and doing the games and everything we had the same person offering the same experience you know with all the shouting and all the experiences just through the, the webcam uh, and and yeah and actually we saw that people really and fans really enjoyed talking with each other and uh and and we do a lot of activations uh, quick games and uh and yeah and they can tell their opinion they can ask questions and so on so that worked really well um and, and yeah, and this is the, when we started the, the platform. And now what we see is that uh, uh, we have a lot of people logging from different countries, not only from Lithuania, and actually uh, even more, we have the bigger, the majority of the people are actually not from Kaunas, not from the city where we are. And we also see that we offer two plans. One is um, starting five, that's the name, and it costs three euros. And the other plan is uh, eight euros. And that's MVP plan. 
and we see that 80% of the, of the fans, they choose the more expensive plan. Wow. Uh, so yeah, that, that works really well. And, and also we see that we, you know, we keep asking what's working, what's not, and we're learning a lot. Uh, and, and we see that we managed to exceed the expectations of our fans. So I think we're on the right way. We just started doing um, friendly games that we broadcasted only on our own platform. And we see, we saw a big, big boost of, uh, of new subscribers coming in. So, so I do think that this, uh, this, you know, platform is here to stay and, uh, and good addition to, to what we offered before. That's excellent news, Una. I'm very glad to hear it. And um, let's say a similar future loaded question for, for Fabian. Um, what do you think a, a premium customer of the future will look like? Who, who will they be? And more importantly, how do we attract them? Yeah, I have, I have two answers to that. So if I put my sales hat on, uh, I will definitely tell you that we're going to look into uh, more companies as, as uh, our, our future customer. I mean, Munich is a very strong economical area. You know, right now we are hosting the International Car Fair, uh, the IAA. Uh, we have a lot of strong companies um, that are here um, and more international companies are coming like Amazon and, and, and Google are coming here to Munich. Um, so, so we are looking at a very rich portfolio of companies that we can still acquire and where we give them an opportunity for networking. Um, that, you know, like, like Una said, um, that is combined lately with a lot of risk because right now the first thing where, where companies are going to restrict their budget is basically on the, on the uh, entertainment part. Um, which we will fall under then. But um, this is something we definitely see as a huge potential and we are willing to take that risk. Specifically, if you heard me earlier that we need to double our, our VIP ticket portfolio, that's a challenge thing we have. And companies are for sure uh, in, in the target there. If I put my marketing head on, I'm going to tell you that, of course, I need to look into the younger consumer. We need to build up um, you know, like the, 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 the person or the consumer that is experienced the, the game, that is experienced basketball, and we stand for an authentic partner in the sports. They come back as an adult. Maybe they come back then later, um, you know, as somebody who works in a company and potentially the next main, main sponsor, ideally. So we really want to, we really want to join them uh, with a, a permanent, strong um, marketing message that we deliver also as a club uh, so that's something we work on but this is for sure a, a long-term project that we are that we are looking on but it's uh, it's definitely these two um, where we put our complete focus on the one more short term the other one more long term but that's uh, for sure the way to go i think especially in that second one you can see the the bayern munich dna popping through right and this is what you want to connect the next generation to like you did with the last one yeah for sure i mean you know like i said uh i believe that the sport is the strongest link between the club and the consumer uh you need to stand for something uh you need to you need to engage with these young consumers uh right now we're doing that on a very performance based uh level so that means we we have youth teams that all compete for the national champion teams no matter on what age group uh, this has the benefit, of course, for us also on the sports side, but also on an identification side. So we're doing something for the youth. But we need to go way beyond that. We need to, you know, speak more basketball culture. We need to, uh, you know, benefit from, from basketball as an opinion leader sport and, and really get into that. Uh, but again, like this is, this is far ahead. Uh, I, I just started a couple of months ago. So we, we are working on that and uh, it will be a, a long term journey. Fully agree. And of course, we're, we're here to support in any capacity we can. <laughs> uh, Katie, if I, I left 10 minutes for a Q&A, if there's somebody from the, from the crowd that, that wishes to ask a question, we, we can do that now. 
I think I lost right. Katie. Who oh, is going to uh, pose the first question? Who's going to be? There's a lot to take in there. It's amazing to hear, you know, how you're sort of looking, uh, you know, especially with you, Une, you know, what you've done there during COVID. Uh, actually, you probably didn't hear earlier, but Robert Fitzpatrick was saying something very similar. Um, you know, they didn't just sort of think, OK, well, we haven't got any fans in the door. What are we going to do? They actually used uh, the tools they had. So I think I saw somebody putting their hand up. It's Steve McArdle. I haven't got my glasses on. Fire ahead. <laughs> Hi, my is Steve McArdle. As you know, I'm a big basketball fan, and I'm keen to understand where you are drawing your fan base from. Is it from traditional basketball fans? Is it from football fans or neutral sports fans? Um, let me let me take that one first on a general European basis before I kick it off to to Fabian Fabian and, and Une. Um, in terms of the league, we're looking at casual fans. We're looking at new generation. We're looking at people who not necessarily are basketball savvy at this very moment because we're very strong in markets where there's a big basketball background, a basketball tradition. That's kind of we're saturated there. What we need to do is go into new growth markets like the, the country you're in today, the UK, but also Germany, where, where Fabian is in France, where basketball as well as EuroLeague are not as well known. And there's this great opportunity for us to grab fans from the get-go and let's say uh, teach them or develop our brand along with them. And with that, I'll, I'll leave the, the floor open to, to Fabian and Une to develop further. Une, you go ahead. Or shall I? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to repeat the question? No, I, I heard the question. Everything is all right. Yeah. Um, we are lucky because we are one of the, those markets that has ultra basketball tradition. And that has, has come to, from, from uh, the history of, of Lithuania and, and big basketball tradition. But we do a lot of research. And what we see is that the majority of the people right now, of the fans right now, they are saying that they became basketball fan because they were playing basketball themselves as kids or their family members were fans. So we are working hard to uh, basically with, with the overall popularity of the sport in the country. Uh, so, because that, that really matters to us that kids keep playing, they, you know, they, they, are, they, they are involved and, uh, and we want to create as, as much content as possible to keep them engaged and you know, entertained. And uh, I also think just comparing you know, basketball with other sports, uh, I do like basketball a lot. I think it's a very fast, dynamic sport and it has you know great feature. Um, when you look into the younger generation who has not that much, not, not that much patience anymore, you know, and, and basketball, it's so dynamic. A lot of things are happening. It can be on a you know, regular day, uh, work day, in the evening. It's in the inside arena. So you can make a nice show there. And basically it can be you know, entertainment as well as a sport. So I think it has great potential there to attract people who just want to have, you know, who want to, who like the sport and who like what stan, sport stands for, but they also come to, to have a good time and have good experience. Yeah, in, in, in the case of Bayern Munich, it's obviously a little bit different. Um, so, so I always say, you know, that football is obviously the biggest sport, but basketball is most influential. So what I want to say with that is, um, we, of course, use the popularity of the club um, that has some benefits, but that has also some downsides because uh, Bayern Munich is obviously not, not loved everywhere, uh, not in Germany, not on the European scale. So, so it brings you uh, a little bit uh, some, some benefits on the awareness side. Everybody knows you, uh, but you need to make very clear uh, what you stand for and you need to offer the consumer a very good experience and a very good product. Um, and I think that's where, where the difference comes into place, where you can make uh, a nice difference to football. Uh, you know, also club internally is like how you position that, how you make basketball stand for lifestyle and maybe, you know, like football more for the average sports products that, that you know, has a, has a very generic, uh, um, 
how, how can you say that a very ex uh, generic image and uh, you know what i mean it's like um for basketball you talk more about image and experience Uh, you know, like the 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 benefits that Uni explained from the facility down to the image of the players and something I think that all of us ultimately connecting to the sports. Um, you know, there's specifically the 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 consumers that are viewing at basketball in the US. There's a big crossover between, you know, like lifestyle, music and sports. And this is something I think that we need to generate, uh, that we need to use and generate uh, uh, traffic into, into our arenas, into our merchandising stores and be very clear what we stand for. We've probably got enough time for one more question. If anyone, no, everyone's gone very quiet. Sorry, you've got the, the, the post-lunch, so there probably will be too many sandwiches and too much curry. So, uh, and we won't mention the, the, the bar uh, either. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us. We obviously hope next year to see you in person um, when I'll be buying the three of you a beer uh, for butchering your names. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you hopefully in real life very, very soon. Thank you very much, Katie. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.